In this tutorial, I'm going to go over navigational aids to pilots, in particular the non-directional beacon. My intention will only be to explain what NDBs are, how they work, and what are some of the systems involved. In terms of implementing the NDB for navigation and flying techniques, I'll have another tutorial on that just to keep things separate. One of the first things we'll see is that the NDB operates between 190 and 1750 kilohertz, and we can find it on the sectional chart as a magenta uh, matted circle, and each NDB is going to have a three-letter name and a Morse code identifier. Now keep in mind, just like a VOR, if it has a Morse code identifier and it also has voice capabilities, when you start talking, the Morse code will turn off until you finish talking, so that way it's not beeping that code over your voice and then it becomes impossible to understand what you're saying. In addition, there could be a letter W next to the NDB class designator, and that's going to mean that voice transmission is not supported. And here we can see an example of an NDB called uh, Gaithersburg, and the three-letter identifier is Golf Alpha India. We can see it's on channel 385, and here we can see the most Morse code identifier. Now, NDBs are pretty old. They're going to be phased out, and so are VORs. It's going to be eventually all replaced with GPS because it's more accurate and reliable. Um, but in the meantime, it's important to know what they are and why they're useful. And they're useful because they're great for low-altitude um, signals. They have they don't require a terribly lot amount of power to operate the NDB antenna and you get fairly decent and consistent range at low altitudes whereas the VOR is really optimized for mid to high level altitudes now here we can see that NDB facility which is given by this radio tower which has these uh, signals emanating out from it on the aircraft side we need to have two antennas one of them is a sense antenna and that's basically coming off here the mid portion of the fuselage and connecting to the tail and if you look at an airplane and you see that wire that extends out to the tail that's what it is it's a sense antenna and then on top of that we also need a loop antenna on a more modern aircraft it's contained within this kind of shark fin looking antenna in an older airplane it will be an actual loop usually it's above the uh, uh, cockpit of some of the older airplanes and the idea is that the sense antenna will detect the signal coming from the station equally in all directions whereas the loop antenna will see the signal the best or the strongest when the center of the loop or the hole where the hole is is at a right angle to the incoming signal. So basically the incoming signal from the station is going right through the center loop of the uh, loop antenna. That gives you the maximum signal. And if it's 90 degrees, so it's seeing this, the signal seeing the loop edgewise, then the signal will be a minimum or zero. And by looking at the difference between the signal in the loop and the signal in the sensing antenna, you can determine the direction or bearing to the station. Now some of the more modern aircraft will not have the sense antenna. Instead it will have a sense loop antenna that's integrated together and that will look like this unit over here on the left. Now we need to turn that signal into something useful for the pilot. So what we have is the ADF or automatic direction finder which is located on the instrument panel and then we also have to be able to tune to a particular station so we have the ADF radio and here we can see the channel and then also the associated frequency in kilohertz now let's take a quick look at how the instruments work and there's two main different types well technically three um, there's the fixed or rotating card ADF which is given here on the left and then there's the RMI or radio magnetic indicator here on the right. So the difference between the two of them is, is kind of simple. The RMI essentially combines the ADF 
and your directional gyro into one instrument so it uses up less panel space. Essentially in the RMI the needle will always point towards the station and give you the direct heading that you can turn the aircraft to to fly directly to the station. So here we can see that if we turned our aircraft to a heading of about 323 it would take us directly to the ADF station. On the other hand if we look over here on the fixed or rotating card ADF the value that we get in this example so we have the heading directly at north the value that we get is about I would say this is going to be 90, 80, maybe 74 degrees to the left. So we would have to subtract 74 degrees from what we have on our directional gyro or our compass and that's the heading we turn the aircraft to to go directly to the station. So that's the main difference. Now with a rotating card you could rotate this card so that you have the same heading on the ADF as you do on your DG and keep in mind your DG is going to be changing if the airplane is turning and the card isn't going to turn unless you manually turn it so you want to keep the airplane level and you want to have the ADF and the DG at the same indicated value on the top then you can read where the needle points to and that will give you the heading you can turn the airplane to in a sense it essentially becomes the equivalent to an RMI at this point and it tells you exactly the heading you can turn to to fly to the station but once you start turning that's no longer going to be the same value because remember this card isn't going to rotate as you start turning so you have to write it down and keep in mind what was your target heading once you turn to that heading, the needle should become more or less straight to the station. You'll see what your heading is on the DG, and you rotate that card again so that you have the same value lined up on both of these. So you can see it's a little bit more workload for the pilot. Here in this video, you can see a quick demonstration of me rotating the card. Now notice as I rotate the card, that needle doesn't deviate. The needle always points towards the station the card is just giving you a relative index and so when it's at north if we're on the left we're gonna subtract from what value we see here if we're on the right we're gonna add what value we see here and it's pretty easy to get a mental picture of this with a little bit of practice so now let's take a look at the difference between the two of them in action so here you can see now we're turning notice that this is always pointing to north and as we're turning the ADF needle is pointing that way and it doesn't tell us what our heading is but the RMI tells us exactly what heading we should turn to directly so how are we going to use the ADF or the ADF and NDB it's important to note that there's no flag on the ADF receiver like there is on a VOR receiver so the only way to know that you have a signal from the NDB is to listen for that Morse code and you need to consistently and persistently listen for that signal because you wanna you don't wanna hear it and then fly for 10 miles and completely ignore it and maybe the station went off since then or maybe you're not getting reliable signal so we're gonna tune in to identify first we're going to read the value on the ADF and depending on what type it is it's going to affect how we interpret the reading as we just saw on the last slide and then we're going to maneuver the aircraft to the NDB now there's also some limitations to an NDB in particular during a lightning storm precipitation static mountainous terrain and coastal refraction the NDB can become unreliable. It'll give you false values. In particular, an NDB is always going to point you directly to a storm, and that's because a storm has a lot of static electricity, and that static electricity gives off um, magnetic uh, radiation, which is what a radio signal is, and it's going to have significant interference and in give you a very potentially dangerous situation if you follow it straight into a storm. 
it would be pretty obvious that you're going to a storm during the daytime, but if you're flying at nighttime and it's a black sky, you can get into a storm very quickly before you even realize it. It can sneak up on you. There's also some lim limitations at nighttime, and there's what's known as night effect. So the NDB is going to be most susceptible with an hour within an hour of sunset to sunrise and it can be limited in range to 60 miles for land and 100 miles for sea at nighttime. Now what's going to happen is the NDB is going to give off its signals, it's radiating these signals, it's going to hit the ionosphere and bounce back and you're going to get a reflected wave or reflected sky wave. The way the NDB is really designed to work is to propagate signals out straight laterally out towards the sides. So the aircraft is expecting to see this signal coming straight to it in a sideward direction. But what it's also going to get is some signals that are bouncing off the atmosphere and coming back at an angle. And because of that, it's going to give you a little bit of an error or erroneous reading from your ADF needle. So you have to be careful and you have to make sure you're listening for that Morse code identifier and you have a good strong signal. There's no static to it. There's no hums. And here you can see the references with which I got this information. Um, a great reference is the first one, Operational Notes on Non-Directional Beacons and Associated Automatic Direction Finding uh, Contents by the Civil Aviation Authority. You can get some information also on your FAR AIM, although it's much more limited than the first reference. And then you can also look at the Jepson Private Pilot Book. But again, that's going to be more uh, procedural, not as much technical. So that's the main uh, thrust as it goes for NDBs. They're pretty simple. They're going to be phased out, but it is good to know what they are, why they're important, and how they work.